Welcome to episode 217 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, I apologize for interrupting your week of rest. Hey, yes, I had to wake <laughs> up for this. Um, I was planning to sleep all week, as our Twitter fans know, I guess, for and friends. Yeah, but, so for yeah. those who, who weren't tracking, you were keeping a running to-do list of everything you had to do during CppCon, the three talks, the field trip, the training, and then the last item was sleep for a week, I believe, right? It was sleep for one week, and I am I am not asleep at the moment, although it's not obvious this is being recorded just a few days after CppCon. Fortunately, yeah. I didn't have to travel, so I didn't have jet lag or anything. Right. So did you get to get some good rest for the past two, three days, though? Yeah, pretty good. Um, I'm starting to get caught up. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, at top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got a tweet from Gulick, and he writes, uh, Supercast about Herb's talk. You could find the folks that think exceptions and RTTI are bad and need to die. They need to come out and propose something. The community can't have a good debate on the subject when only half of the interested parties show up to the conversation. And, yeah, I guess he's talking about Herb's uh, CVPCon keynote where he's talking about his proposals to, you know, do static exceptions and have uh, reflection as an alternative to using RTTI. And I see what he's saying, but I, I do think Herb is, I guess, trying to address the concerns of that half of the community that doesn't use exceptions in RTTI. Um, but maybe it would be worth talking to someone and see if they think Herb's proposals will work for them. Yeah, and I, I you know, I'm curious now because we've had a bunch of game developers and such on. Have we ever had anyone on who worked in a code base where they did dash F no exceptions or no RTTI and like actually fully disabled it? I don't know. I don't remember it coming up. But that's that's the category of people that he's talking about is the people who disable it in the compiler. Right. I saw our, our guest is raising his hand, so we'll get to him in a minute and uh, get his opinion on uh, Herb's proposals. But yeah, it's it's definitely something worth talking about. I, I think, I'm sure the committee will be listening to lots of feedback. You know, these proposals, you know, it would be great if they made it into 2023, but uh, I'm not even sure if that's going to happen. 2029, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're pretty big proposals, but... Uh... I'm, I'm sure the committee will, you know, listen to all voices about it. I mean, that was actually one of the things Herb talked about in his talk about how you can't have a uh, rule by majority with big changes right. like this. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cbcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes and subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Philip Schrader. Phil started working in consulting primarily as a C programmer, very quickly, he found himself being tempted by the famous object-oriented programming language called C++. He started volunteering at a local high school robotics program where they use C++ to make their robots competitive. Hooked on C++, he found Peloton Technology, where he had the chance to learn and explore what C++ is capable of, and he's still exploring. Phil, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So why were you uh, raising your hand a minute ago? Oh, you said I'm curious if we've you know ever had anyone on the show who actually does add f no rtti to their compiler options and right we we actually do do that okay just so, no rtti or no exceptions as well uh no exceptions also okay um mostly for uh, i guess mostly for reasons that I'm not super privy to, but uh, it has to do some, uh, to some extent it has to do with uh, adhering to real-time constraints in, right. uh, in our environment. And so exceptions are historically not very real-time friendly. And so uh, that's one of the reasons we've disabled them. I honestly haven't tried exceptions on, say, Clang or the latest Clang release or something like that. I, like, I haven't tried them in a while, but just from a historical point of view, we've always had them disabled. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, I, I think in an art in a real time situation, it often comes down to the fact that in throwing an exception incurs a dynamic allocation, and that's not something that you can guarantee the 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 runtime cost of real time cost of. 
Yeah, I, that that's a that's a good summary of it. Yeah. Well, now there are a, you could theoretically all probably get around that there are real time memory allocators, um, but we we don't happen to use one, so disabling exceptions is a pretty straightforward thing to do. That's interesting. Maybe uh, well, sure. Why not? Let's talk about it now. Um, I've I've I. Uh, excuse me, and all the like hard real-time systems that I'm aware of, people just don't do allocations. I didn't know that there were real-time allocators that could address that. Well, uh, I mean, so I, I'm, we don't use any, so I'm personally, I couldn't name one, sure. but I know that one of my coworkers has at least about look, looked into one and evaluated a couple and such. Um, but the way I guess I see it is that if you call malloc and you're on and you, you just have, you know, a gigabyte of RAM already available, right, then you could just return a chunk of that and that that is a constant time operation at that point. So I don't know. I mean, that's obviously a gross oversimplification, but uh, roughly speaking, if you you know if you're if you're not asking the OS for you know to pause your process while you go get some memory, then that could be a constant time operation. It sounds akin to what a lot of game developers do: allocate a giant chunk of memory up front and then just do whatever they need to with it after that. Yeah. That that. That's roughly what I'm imagining, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So, Phil, we got a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and we'll start talking more about the work you're doing at Peloton, okay? Sounds great. Okay, so this first one, uh, kind of going back to our feedback, is the CBCon 2019 keynotes are all up. Um, and that's, you know, starting with Bjarna's and ending with Herb Sutter's at the end of the week, including the other uh, three plenary talks in the middle of the week. Um, and Jason, remind me, how long does it usually take for some of the other videos to go live? I think they usually come out in like batches of like 50 videos at a time or something like that. Right? Yeah, we should start to see a stream of them coming out pretty quickly here. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're not sitting around waiting to edit them, right? They're processing them and getting them all ready right now. Yeah. So I, I would expect it, you know, it many videos every week to come out personally, but it should I, uh, probably ultimately take five or six weeks or something maybe to get all, all of them and all of the lightning talks edited. And I can only imagine how much more effort editing the lightning talks takes. Yeah. And, and on that is... note, there were like five days of lightning talks, I think. Yeah. How big ahead, is Phil? CPPCon? Uh, yeah. How big, how big is it like in terms of? attendees and talks and uh, about 1300 people this yeah. year and five days. five days with between six and eight tracks at any given moment is that right four yeah. tracks a day four tracks a day plus the keynote plus the keynote i think that. that's right so somewhere on the 25 ish talks a day for five days at least a hundred and something talks i looked oh, wow. at how okay. many episodes were in the previous uh, year playlists and it was uh, last year was 151 at, for the full talks and 43 lightning talks. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Previous year was, was 139 and 55. So I, I don't know if we went up again in the number of talks, but figured um, about 150 probably. I'm certain we did because we didn't have the space to do things like eight tracks and some of the and some of the moments like we did this time. I think it was eight was the, I don't know, it was big. It was big. Right. Too much for any person to absorb. <laughs> <laughs> um, and going back uh, one more time to that uh, piece of feedback about exceptions in RTTI, Phil, did you have a chance to uh, watch Herb's talk? Or are you familiar with his proposals about uh, static exceptions and reflection? I haven't. I've, I've definitely been excited by the, snippets over the past few years at least where people mm -hmm. have talked about static reflection or compile time reflection and all those things um, but I haven't had a chance to uh, listen to Herb Sutter yet 
Okay. Well, but, you should uh, definitely um, uh, go watch the talk. It's a good one. Okay, good. Yeah, no, the... Um, I definitely want to use exceptions more, particularly... Well, perhaps I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but um, we periodically run into problems importing third-party libraries that do make use of exceptions. Mm. And then when you, comp you want to compile a big binary together, generally it's fine when you have one library compiled without exceptions, another with exceptions and put them into a binary, but sometimes you do run into headaches and problems. So I would it love to... sound risky. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's highly not recommended. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely super excited to actually use a feature of C++ that I haven't used in, well, many years at this point. So, Oh, interesting. Very much looking forward to it. I'm gonna. I, I've made some notes here. I'm gonna ask you more about your error handling. What you do today, once we get to the main part of the interview, also without exceptions. Sounds great. Okay. Uh, and then another thing uh, from CVBCon is we're starting to see some trip reports come out. Uh, Matt Godbolt uh, released his trip report where he's talking about all the keynotes and then some of his uh, talk highlights, including his own talks. Is there uh, anything you want to comment about uh, Master Report, Jason? I mean, nothing specific, but he did highlight lots of good talks, talks that I wish that I'd had the chance to see, but uh, for various reasons didn't get to. JF's uh, Let's Deprecate Volatile, yeah. Kate's talk on naming, I heard from outside the room, unfortunately, so I only heard a little bit of that. <laughs> I was getting ready for my next talk after that one. Do you and, say master report because Jason was there? Or is is there like a thing called the master report? Um, I'm sorry, Matt's trip report. Uh, oh, God. Matt's trip yeah. report. Sorry. God. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, th these trip reports are, are great in highlighting talks, and you can kind of use them as a guide when you decide which talks to watch uh, once the YouTube videos are live. So I know I would like to watch some of these that I did not see in person. I heard um, Peter Bindles and Cybrand's talk, uh, Hello World from Scratch, was really interesting. I want to see that yeah, one. Yeah, I did go to that one. That was fun. They yeah. they do do a good job of um, uh, balancing each other, responding to each other and stuff as as partner speakers. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, Bjarne's keynote, C++ at 20, I saw some complaints on Twitter about how he starts out by saying uh, that he's giving lots of high-level things, and each one of these high-level things is at least an hour talk at the conference, and many of them are things that were being talked about at the conference. So, like, uh, doesn't that say that there's a problem with the language? But I don't think that's fair. I mean, to say that that means there's a problem with the language personally, because fully understanding what any programming language is going to do is going to have lots of depth to it. Oh, yeah. you mean the fact that there is an hour on just one aspect of the language is a yeah. problem? Yeah, that's what some people were saying on Twitter, and I'm like, I, I just don't think that's fair. Yeah, yeah, I don't agree with that. Right. I mean, every time I watch Bjarne, it's amazing to me how simple he can make his slides look a lot mm. of the times. When I, when I do a presentation on C++, it's especially my code snippets take up the entire slide they're, <laughs> they're you know like uh, like int i equals something and then maybe i'll squeeze a comment in there to explain it and every time i see bjarne especially his keynote uh, this time around it just he made it seem so simple and i don't know i i think perhaps in my mind i have much uglier version of C++ in my head than, than uh, Bjarne does. And I think that's a good thing, uh, that, that he has a vision that C++ can truly be, you know, the language for everyone. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt you, I'm sorry. No, 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 I was done. Okay. Um, someone asked me at CVPCon for, like, a book that has, like, good examples for learning and understanding C++ better. And I thought about it, and, and the answer I gave was not one that I, I expected to give. And I said, read, pick up any of Bjarne's C++ books. And, you know, 
just look at the examples because he does subtly different things than like anyone else does. And there's a few things that I've picked up from him. Like if you are printing a single character to see out, he uses the single quote because it is a single character. He doesn't use the double quote, which has to be handled differently as a string with a potential call to Sterling. Like there's these little differences. And if you just read it, you're going to pick up random things that you don't expect to. Yeah. Yeah, it was definitely, uh, I mean, part of some of the things that he was pointing out are C++ 20 only and that I'm not super familiar with. Um, yeah. And so, for example, his example, uh, yeah, his examples with uh, concepts. Is that the name? Concepts? No. Uh, Probably concepts. Concepts. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. I should. I should really know this. Um, like constraining but, templated types. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And just that. Just. I. I don't know. Anyway, he. He. He made it sound super useful and and or just the way he talked about them and gave such casual examples almost uh just amazed me and i always feel that way when i when i see him when i when i see him present something it's cool yeah okay and then the last article we have is uh from lvm and they just released uh version 9.0 which Sounds like it should be a pretty significant release, right? It does. I feel very confused. <laughs> what, what are you confused about? Well, I read the Clang release notes, and if I click on C++ language features, it's like two things. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I must be missing something here, because I know Clang 9 versus the previous version has lots of like C++ 20 stuff. Right. Implemented, and I feel like maybe I just am like clicking on the the wrong thing. I don't know. Well, but are you're you're looking at LLVM versus Clang? Uh, I clicked they, on the Clang they... release notes sub sub one oh, down there. It. And maybe this is just the release notes versus like the pre-release version. I have no idea. I I don't know. I feel like I'm going nuts here. Maybe they should be summarizing like everything that's different in Clang nine from Clang eight. I don't know. Yeah. So do they? Uh, oh, that's interesting. Oh, sorry. Do do does Clang get released at the same time as LLVM? Because I saw the LLVM announcement, but I didn't. I'm I'm never sure if they're separate projects technically, or if they just happen to. You know, they track. are technically separate projects, but they release all... So if you click on the um, uh, mailing list release, there's uh, the Clang notes, the Clang extra notes, the LLD notes, the libcxx notes. They're all like tied together with a 9.0 release. Right. Fair enough, yeah. Although I, the thing I just said, oh, that's interesting, is that... Uh, the static analyzer now has dash analyzer dash w error to turn analyzer warnings into errors. So now oh. if you want static analysis to be hard errors also, you can turn that on for your continuous integration builds. It's a good feature. Oh, here we go. So in libc++, we see c++20 things being added. Standard swap is now const expert. Been waiting for that one. <laughs> um... Uh, is constant evaluated, is officially supported. Standard midpoint, which I think um, uh, I think there was a talk on just the implementation of standard endpoint for C20 from Marshall Clow. I think that's right at CVPCon. Is that uh, sorry, standard midpoint? Yeah, yeah, standard endpoint. midpoint. Like you give it like a couple of points on a line, and it tells you what the midpoint is. Apparently, oh. that's a surprisingly difficult algorithm to get exactly right with all the possibility of like rounding errors and whatever. Oh, and a naive implementation, you could have like integer overflow or something like that. Yep. And probably, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That sounds. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it the sounds like one... something that's trivial, but it's not. Yeah. 
Yeah, especially integer overflow is something that I generally, you know, it's not the first thing that I worry about when, when writing something. So uh, when you deal with big numbers, it suddenly does become important. Right. Yeah. The other one that I thought was super interesting is um, the uh, more undefined behavior optimizations, like oh, uh, the the that. one that was, or uh, I think I thought it was part of this release where they, uh, if you try to write to a const address, like to a con to a pointer pointing to const, basically it'll optimize it away, or it, it'll it's a uh, you know, if you, uh, the, the example in the bug report that was filed against Clang 9, the Linux kernel had a const, extern const int something rather, and in one of the functions it cast, it did a, you know, a C style cast to just a regular int, and then it wrote to it. And the new Clang 9 just deleted that whole call, because well, it's undefined behavior to write to a to a const uh, location. Object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, by definition, it can't happen, I guess, or depending on how you want to phrase it. And so, they fixed. They ended up fixing it in the kernel itself by not declaring the integer as const and, and whatnot. I, I think that's that's what the patch ended up being, but. Um, Anyway, it was just, I'm always excited by the compiler kind of uh, not making excuses for the programmer, but rather <laughs> forcing the programmer to, uh, you know, actually follow the, the spec and, 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 you know, not do things that happen to work, but that actually should work. Right. Yeah, I found the actual note you're referring to here. It says LLVM will now remove stores to constant memory. That's that's the gist of it. Yeah. Yeah, those are the kinds of changes that that excite me maybe more than they should, I guess. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I, I I love the, I love those like where, you know, stop stop making excuses for the programmer and just and just, you know, do follow yeah, just just Follow the language, basically. Just, just right. adhere to it. <laughs> That's like uh, I think we've we've brought this up on the show a couple of times now. But you you used to be able to like check if this was null, which is illegal. This can never be null if you're inside a member function, and GCC made it a default behavior to remove that check. Something like five years ago now, and there was a minor uproar because of all the code <laughs> that it broke. And people are like, no, your code was broken from the beginning. <laughs> like, right. if you were if you were calling a member function on an object that had already been, you know, gnawed out, like, what are you even thinking? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's definitely what it reminded me of. That's true. Yeah. Okay, so Phil, could you start off by telling us about uh, what Peloton Tech is, uh, the company you work for, and, and what your role is there? Uh, yeah. I guess I, the first thing I should clarify that we're not the bicycle company. <laughs> when, I did uh, wonder that at first. Yes. <laughs> when uh, I, I went to every once in a while, I meet I meet someone. Uh, the first time it happened to me at the Basel conference two years ago, and uh, someone came up to me and said, uh, "You know, what do you do for Peloton? My dad really loves your product." And uh, anyway, it's just our product was not released yet, so I doubt anyone is really loving it at this point. But um, it's it's always funny that you have to clarify. So Peloton Technology, the platooning company, uh, we basically focus on a uh, cruise control system for semi-trucks, okay. so that um, uh, you can take two, two semis and have them 
drive behind one another at a distance where the air resistance is lowered enough that you start getting fuel savings. Um, and I, th I think the, the rough numbers that uh, we have on our website are something like 5% fuel savings for the front vehicle and around 10% for the rear vehicle. Um, and I'm, I really don't know anything about fluid dynamics, but it has something to do with uh, the buffeting of the wind on the back of the trailer for the front truck that gets reduced. So the air is more streamlined going, you know, across the trailer and the, uh, of the front truck and just kind of keeps going over the, over the tractor of, in the back kind of thing. Right. And so, and the tractor in the back at the same time doesn't have as much air to push out of the way because it's already being pushed out of the way of the front tractor or the, the, the whole truck kind of thing. Um, anyway, so roughly speaking, uh, Peloton technology builds a, a cruise control system for, for that so that um, you can safely uh, platoon for fuel saving purposes. And I don't, as I said, I'm not involved in the fluid dynamics part of it or the uh, or really the, the control, I'm not a controls guy. Okay. Um, but I work on the, on the, on the platform. So I make sure that, you know, Linux is running, our microcontroller lets the, uh, the controls guys do their thing. So, you know, make sure that all the message passing is working. Um, and yeah, just that all the information that, the people need from the sensors is available. Just that 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 kind of stuff. Um, I don't know if there's a like a good term for that kind of a role, but uh, no, no. Does that give you an idea of, of yeah. what what my what I do? And I think uh, maybe for the sake of our listeners around the world, just to clarify, we're talking about these giant eighteen wheeler big rig trucks that crisscross across America that. You know, depending on where you live, they either don't exist at all or there aren't as many of them. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, when I when I say semis, yeah, I'm talking about the... Some people call them 18-wheelers. Um, I don't actually know if they're... If they have 18 wheels. I, have, I think in some configurations they do. I think the ones that have yeah. two rear drive axles with, 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 with dualies on both of the rear drive axles... And then you add in the wheels in the trailer. I think it actually does add up to 18 wheels. So that's eight and then 10 just on the tractor. And then you just need eight more on the rear. Yeah, no, I guess that's fair. Yeah. Okay. No, that's fair. Yeah, we, there, those are the kinds of questions that perhaps I should already know the answers to. Uh, <laughs> My grandpa was a trucker for a long time. So that's why the only reason I've ever thought about it really. Nice. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, so big uh, tractors, uh, the, um, yeah, so the, the tr when I say tractor, I'm talking about the, the, the vehicle with the engine in it, and then there's a, separately, there's the trailer that the tractor is hauling, and in general, we colloquially call that a truck. Right, right. Um. And how much of the truck is actually being controlled by the Peloton software when it's being platooned like this? Uh, good question. Um, it's so it, going back to the cruise control analogy. Mm -hmm. um, it 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 really is a cruise control in that sense. So it it takes over your um, longitudinal acceleration. So it, you, you basically can take your foot away from the gas pedal and the brakes. So it will, it'll essentially speed up and slow down for you. Uh, but you still have to, well, sorry, I'm, this is all from 
the perspective of the person in the rear trailer or in the in the rear tractor. Okay. The front tractor driver has to do well everything that he would do normally. Oh, okay. okay. And so, so that that's just a more or less a regular truck with additional sensors, essentially. The one in the back is where where it's really the only place that's interesting to talk about, because again, the, the front is kind of a regular truck, and the back is where the cruise control system lives and takes over the acceleration and braking in order to keep at a close gap between the between the two trucks um, but the so even in the back you still have to steer to stay in the lane uh, and, and stuff like that um, but yeah does that does that yeah. answer that now yeah. it's a uh, it's kind of it's kind of like if, if you imagine like being on the on the road and you engage your cruise control system to go at a constant 60 miles per hour or something. Um, it, it's it's basically like that, except you don't control the speed. You just say, you know, do your thing. And then depending on the speed that the driver and the front truck is deciding to go, that's the same speed that you in the back will go also at, at some certain gap. Right. So you said, uh, now if I understood right, the software that you write isn't the control system, it's, it coordinates things, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's basically, at the core of it, it's really uh, a, a message passing system, I okay. guess, that uh, uh, kind of like a pub sub system. Mm -hmm. And so someone who does write an algorithm to control that gap between the two trucks doesn't have to worry about all the nitty gritties of oh how do I get information from here to there they just get a you know like an object like a sender object that they can pass a message to and then the software that I'm responsible for takes care of actually sending the message across and making it to the other processes or the other processors in the system, et cetera, et cetera. So does uh, either truck have any kind of like user interface display that tells them like what's going on with the vehicles around them or anything? Uh, yeah, so there is a display in both trucks, like a little... Um, 800 by 400 display okay. uh, tells them roughly, you know, what what gap you're you're currently at, and and this is this applies to both the front and the back. So you can see in the front even you can see oh, you know, the, the truck behind me is this far, you know, has a gap of well whatever the gap is at that time. Uh, even if you're not actually platooning yet, it'll give you some information about oh you're you're paired with this other truck and this the other truck is say a mile ahead of you mm. you know it, it can give you all kinds of information it can also give you information about saying uh, there's traffic coming up ahead um, we might and the system might disable platooning and actually grow the gap ahead of time before reaching heavy traffic for safety oh, reasons. Okay. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. And 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 it'll give you those kinds of, you know, heads up uh, to 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 keep the driver informed. Because yeah, I'd imagine having a system like that without any sort of feedback would be quite intimidating. <laughs> right. Right. But uh, yeah, so and there's there's a button on the dash, kind of like you know your regular cruise control. There's or you know maybe it's in the steering wheel or something um, where you enable cruise control. You change the speed uh, again for our system. You can't adjust the speed, but uh, there's a button that you can push and you know enable, and then the display will update either saying oh you know can't platoon right now because 
of rain or something, I, whatever. Or or it'll go ahead and start control taking over and controlling the speed and, and such. So on the topic of like safety kind of issues, does it uh, do things like take into account the local regulations for safe following distances or weight of the load or whatever? Uh, yeah. So the the system does compute the the weight of the of the tr of the truck that it's in. Okay. Um, I don't pretend to know the math of how it does that. No, don't worry about that. At, yeah, that's fine. At the core of it, uh, the way our control sky explains it to me is that there's, you know, there's F equals MA, the fa famous physics yeah. equation yeah. where force times mass times acceleration. If you do that a whole bunch of times, you basically get a good idea of what your own mass is. Okay. And if you if both trucks can do that successfully then you can make decisions based on their individual weights and you know which one it would be safer to have in front versus the back um i forget the other examples that you mentioned in your question but yeah the it does it does take a lot of factors into account for example and as i mentioned like if it detects rain like if you turn on your windshield wipers for example it'll oh okay you know it, it'll it'll deduce that it you know that it must be raining theoretically and so it'll it'll use a bunch of uh input like that it, it also has a connection to our uh, central server that you know has more information from like the weather service and the the road conditions like if there's construction and stuff like that right um, yeah sorry did that did i mm -hmm. yep. did i Good. miss yeah. something i, nope. I feel like i missed one of your examples there but no, That's no, I, I, I laughed for a moment because I was thinking if you turn on your windshield wipers, there's a good chance it's either raining or you're in Florida during love bug season and <laughs> you're just going to have to stop and just scrub those things off at some point. Anyhow, cause have either of you experienced that? That is great. I've heard of them, but I have not experienced it. I don't. Are, are love bugs a specific kind of bug or you just mean that it's... That's uh, lo love bugs. Oh, I mean, it is. I, it's a colloquial name of some sort, but they are um, uh, a, a small flying beetles. And during mating season, they fly around attached to each other, and you end up with them. Like you, your windshield wipers do no good. You have to stop at the gas <laughs> station and like use the scrubbing oh, no. thing because otherwise you just can't see out the windshield. It <laughs> it can be it can be nasty. It's um, it's its own thing for sure. Yeah, got it. Fair enough. So I've never experienced that myself. However, if you're having trouble seeing out of your windshield because of said love bugs, chances are you don't want to be platooning either. You're right. That's so. okay. <laughs> great. That's a great point. <laughs> um, when I was at CVCon last week, I did go to this one talk uh, from Michael Wong about writing safety critical automotive C++ software. And I... You know, learned a few things that I wasn't aware of um, about uh, these standardization processes that I guess vehicle control software has to follow. Um, do these affect you? I, I heard of like Misra and Autos are. Is it, are these standards you have to follow in your work? Uh, short answer: Not really. Oh, okay. Um, with caveats. Um, <laughs> So the way that uh, I think one of my coworkers first put it when I joined a few years ago at this point um, is that trucking is special. So there are a lot of standards around passenger vehicles. Okay. The most famous one perhaps is uh, ISO 26262 where they specify essentially a process that you should follow and document and, and, and such when developing a passenger vehicle. Um, 
there is no such, or well, up till I think the most recent uh, revision of that standard does include trucking. But the, anyway, the, the, the long story short, for a very long time, there really were no standards mandated by the industry, for example, to that apply to trucking. Um, so we we don't we don't have really any other than so we try to follow ISO two six two six two anyway, uh, just because it's it's the best guide guiding post that we have, so to speak. Um, but there's nothing mandated in in that way now if you when you are developing a product that tries to integrate with someone else's system you know then if they want you to follow certain processes or in this case when i when i say someone else's system right like if you're trying to make a system for trucks then the people making those trucks they have the right to mandate that you know your own development processes follow certain standards or, or you know that that you show them various I don't know, documentation whatever documented processes things like that okay um, yeah so we don't we don't follow misra uh, we've definitely considered it um, it is at the time that we started the project uh, the misra c++ standard i think was still in either I think it was might have been O three, like C plus plus O three, which felt very restrictive. Right. Um, and one of the things that, at least, uh, they specify in Misra is something like uh, you know no pointers, so pass everything by value. Okay. And so, I feel like uh, I mean, which is totally doable. But uh, with the advent of things like move semantics, a lot of those concerns, I think, are not as valid anymore. Uh, I mean, the primary reason being, you know, if you do have pointers, kind of almost by definition, you're probably doing manual memory management. And so uh, if you're doing that, then there's a whole class of bugs that, that happen, and so if you just eliminate pointers from the system entirely, there's a whole class of bugs that, by definition, can't happen. And so, right. um, anyway, so we use C++11 in our code base uh, with, you know, unique pointers and, and all of that, uh, the, the, the tools that mod what I would call modern C++ gives us. Right. So your your specific role in doing this uh, message passing coordination that and we hinted at real time before this is like it sounds pretty like hard real time like you have to make sure those messages get from point A to point B otherwise things go bad yeah if the truck in front of you starts breaking you need to break right now <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah exactly so um, so I mean that that that's definitely one aspect of it of yeah basically if you send a message, you're more or less promising that the message arrives within a certain time at the other end, right? Uh, given priorities and the like. So if, mm -hmm. you know, just because you send a high priority message, some low priority process doesn't necessarily, can not necessarily expect to be woken up right away to process that message. Mm -hmm. But anyway, there's always, uh, Asterisks, asterisks, I guess. Right. Um, but at the same time, the the algorithm developers or the controls guys also have to also have to take into account. Well, if this message doesn't arrive on time, because say the network link is down or some other part of the system has failed in some way, you do have to take corrective action. Okay. Um, so. And you know, with redundant sensors, that that risk is reduced, and and such. 
Uh, but anyway, so what I'm trying to say is that there's, you know, you have to tackle the same problem from both sides. On one hand, yeah, you make your best effort to make the system robust and, you know, make the message passing uh, reliable. But at the same time, you have to work with the assumption that, yeah, sensors fail. Um, the message that you send out won't make it, one reason or another, radio interference, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you do have to take that into account also. Maybe I took your question into a different angle than nope. what you were trying to get at. But, no. um, but I mean, you already said before that you can't use exceptions. So I am kind of curious what you do do for the error handling case. So the control stuff, it sounds like, is more like kind of embedded. It sounds like you're maybe a little bit less embedded. You talked about Linux and like you maybe have a real operating system available. I'm going for it. Oh, I, I like the term real operating system. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, you know, whatever, the lines are so blurry these days, <laughs> no, I right? Know, I know. Like... <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have, uh, we have uh, basically, yeah, so we have Linux that, 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 does, that does run the control algorithms. We have a microcontroller with an RTOS that is there as kind of a watchdog slash, you know, monitor. Mm. So it makes sure that, uh, so, and that one is, you know, hard real time, highly reliable. It has, you know, it's a Cortex R5. So it has the, I forget exactly what it is. It has the, it has the cores, the CPU, there's a, there's two copies of it at 90 degrees rotation in 90, you know, 90 degrees out of sync in lockstep with each other. Wow. So that if they ever, they, and they run the same code, and if, if they ever produce different results, then, you know, then you know something is wrong, uh, you know, in, in the system and stuff. Anyway, so that, that is a whole, there's a whole cool, Another aspect of, I guess, the hardware <laughs> side of it. But I had anyway. no idea that was a thing at all. That's uh, oh, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's it's pretty impressive what what the hardware folks come up with these days. Um, but anyway, so we have the sort of our safety watchdog monitor that just makes sure that the decisions that the Linux box makes are, you know, safe and. Uh, don't interfere with any of the uh, boundaries that it sets on okay. the gap that can be that it that can be in, in, and such. Uh, okay, at this point, I'm already forgetting what your question was. Uh, but the what I was trying to get at, I think, is that the the we present the same API on both platforms. Uh -huh. And so you can run the same code on either the microcontroller or the or on our Linux box. So the error handling is is very much the same way. So if you you know if you try to send a message and it fails for some reason, you get an error code back and that has to be handled. Which is very uh, which is made a lot easier with uh, the no discard tag. That you I was can... wondering what techniques you use to say it has to be handled. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So no discard is 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 definitely my favorite. Uh, obviously, it doesn't prevent anyone from just you know casting it away and and not doing anything with it. Right. But uh, those kinds of features are. Uh, you know, make our lives a lot easier. Um, but at the end of the day, when an error does happen, as as per internal policy, I guess you could say, you have to keep track of it, and you everything in the system periodically reports its status. One of those things is error counts, like how many times it's encountered and doing an, an how many times it has encountered an error doing a certain thing, okay. such as sending a message or reading from a sensor or, or whatever it may be. Hmm. Um, like packet loss kind of counts or something. Or... Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, or number of times, you know, it 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 had to take corrective action or, or what, whatever it may whatever it may be. Basically, try to report on as many things as you can, and uh, so that you can, if anything does go wrong, you can you can then decide to react, or you know, another system can decide to react based on someone else not taking action, kind of thing. Is that the kind of thing you can also, like, flag for, like, maintenance issues? Like, this cable seems to have gone bad between these two components or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's something that I'm actually working on right now is... Uh, okay. Is, yeah, you try to... I'm basically, based on, like, ping counts between our Linux boxes, if try to diagnose, you know, at which point in the in the network is the failure might lie and try to report that for diagnostics purposes. That sounds like, uh, I mean, a really interesting problem. I think that's like, I don't know, like, um, what is that? I just saw this on like uh, GM turbines for jet planes, like that they can tell you, oh, by the way, we're getting such and such code, which means this component needs to be replaced soon. It's about to fail or whatever. It yeah. sounds like you're working on a similar kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it, it's just to make people's lives easier because you really don't want to spend your time debugging which cable is bad. You want to spend your time, you know, tuning the feel of the system, right? Like, does it is the braking too aggressive, et cetera, et cetera. Like that. That's the kind of thing that I'm that I want people that I want to enable people to do. Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, totally. That that stuff helps a lot. One thing I'm kind of curious about is uh, how does your team go about testing all of their code? I'm guessing you're not getting on to a truck very often and actually driving it around with the system. Do you have emulators? Uh, yeah. So, uh, for, okay. Um, there's a lot of aspects to it, and I don't know if I will remember all of them, or I don't know if we have time to go into all of them. Okay. I am fascinated by all of them, I guess I should say. Go for it. Uh, whatever mode interests you the most. Whatever mode interests me the most. Well, uh, I think I'll touch on a couple regardless. Um, so we have uh, unit tests, I guess, at the core of it. Perhaps uh -huh. no sure. surprise. Um, uh, hopefully no surprise, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, what helps there is, you know, with every check-in that you make or something you push out for review, the whole suite of unit tests gets run, et cetera, et cetera. Then we have a, you know, bigger nightlies that get run that don't necessarily, or, sorry, that'll run more than just what gets run at check-in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we do have physics simulations okay. of, of various platooning scenarios. Uh, so we have, you know, a couple of physics models that let the software, or basically as long as we present, again, so I mentioned that the microcontroller and the Linux box present a certain API to the controls algorithms. Um, and so that the same software can run on those. So as long as we present that same API in like on top of the simulation world, we can very effectively run, uh, you know, sort of a sort of a system test against a simulated system. So we can see how does the UI respond in this situation, for example, um, or how you know if you're trying to reproduce a bug. That was reported like uh, you know I got this error when I didn't expect it to and you can try to reproduce it that way and it helps a lot uh, then we have another level that uh, like a hardware on the loop kind of setup where mm -hmm. we take our actual ECU and we provide it can traffic can mm -hmm. is the network that you know, uh, is used on, on vehicles a lot right? Uh, for the network type. And so we, we feed the ECU, our ECU network, uh, can traffic so that it believes that it's in a truck 
right. and it has to respond to certain signals and we we see how it responds and and stuff like that uh, make sure you know the, does it does it see the that there's something on the radar you know in, in in front of the truck that is you know like a like a passenger vehicle cut in between the two trucks uh, like just because the gap happens to be large enough for a passenger vehicle to come in one of them decided to do just that you know do we respond correctly and in time like in the in the time constraint that we set for ourselves so so that 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 last one i think is the most interesting one to me mm. um, just because it it's a very high level system kind of test and uh it it very quickly makes you realize that all your applications and, and everything in the system run at such a different sort of phase offset from what you are used to in a simulation kind of world. Like in a simulation, when you instantiate all your classes, and and then you know you simulate time, the Basically, it'll always happen the exact same way every time you run the program. Right? Like, mm-hmm. like all the events will happen in the exact same order, in uh, the exact same amount of simulated time apart, et cetera, et cetera. Versus when you have it in a hardware kind of setup, then all of a sudden, that is not true. Your applications will take differently long to start up. They, you know, they might be running a checksum when they start up and such. And so they all have these phase offsets all of a sudden that uh, reveal bugs or, you know, race conditions and, and, and all of that. So that, that, that one is definitely, in my mind, my experience, that, that's been the most interesting one to me. Okay, cool. Well, uh, it's been great having you on the show today, Phil. Uh, is there anything you wanted to plug before we let you go? Uh, is Peloton <laughs> hiring? Uh, do you want to <laughs> let us know about your own social media presence or anything like that? Uh, yeah, uh, definitely hiring. Um, C++ definitely uh, a big plus, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you located? Uh, Mountain View in okay. California. Okay. Um, the commute's not the greatest, I guess, mm. just because of, uh, so I'm, I guess, along the lines of Jason wanting to sleep for three days or, or a week or whatever. I don't suppose a week was the goal, but <laughs> Rob, when, when, uh, fair enough, uh, it, it had to be done. Um, nor when, when the interview started, I'm still normally asleep at that time, uh, just because. I wait for traffic to die down mm. uh, and um, then go in after the big traffic. Anyway, uh, don't really have much social media, so I don't I don't have much to plug there, uh, okay. I suppose. But thank you. I do appreciate it. Okay. Well, it's been great having you on the show today. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it was really fun. Thank you. Thanks for coming on.